Uh, welcome, everybody. We're delighted that you've come back for more. Our advancing mission thriveability adventure continues today. And uh, we're really delighted to have you all here to join us. We know that uh, you're taking time out of your busy schedules to participate. Uh, and as usual, we've got a lot to cover. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll jump in and get started. So bear with me for just one moment. And I think we're good to go. So today is Labinar number two. And again, just by virtue of recap, uh, I think most of you have joined us for Labinar number one and uh, last week's Webversation. Uh, quick show of hands, do we have any newbies here today? Anybody who is new to our sessions joining? Um, I guess I can't see everybody, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll just uh, take a leap of faith here and say that uh, most, if not all of you have been with us. So the topic for today is our continued discussion about strategic decision-making, but both through a mission focus and in economically informed lens. And uh, it's all about helping to dial up your nonprofit's thriveability. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. I'd like to uh, introduce Connor LaGrange just for a moment so he can uh, quickly walk us through a few of our uh, Zoom housekeeping ground rules. Connor, are you there? Of course, thanks, Mike. Uh... I've, I've decided that I, I get the great pleasure of telling people things that they probably already know at this point and could recite in their sleep before bed, given that we've been on Zoom for such a extended period of time. But again, just a reminder, if you would rename yourself with, with your first name and your organization, just so we know who's asking questions and who we're talking to, uh, please remain on mute until you, you're ready to speak. Um, and feel free to add your questions into the chat box throughout and myself and Josephine will be monitoring that uh, like previous times we've been on together. Um, again, I know that we probably all know this, but refreshers are always good. So thank you so much. And we look forward to being with you all today. Mike, back to you. Thank you, Connor. Josephine, I'm gonna let you do your uh, thing. Ask everybody to smile and say cheese so we can get a, uh, a nice Zoom photo. Perfect. So give me a second to set up. And as always, I'm going to take two shots. Because um, like I've said before, if I don't take two, the first one doesn't turn out right for some reason. And if you, there's a few of you without um, your camera on, if you want to turn it on now, that would be great. No, um, no have tos. Connor, can you let um, Barbara in and see if she'll join us? Thanks. Let's wait one second and let's see if she's connecting. I'll just say smile and hold and then I'll say relax. I'll take another and we'll be done. Welcome Barbara. Okay, here we go. We're taking a photo um, and smile and hold. Relax one more time. Smile and hold. Perfect, all done. Thank you guys and thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, Josephine. Okay, so let's continue. Oops, I went backwards. And um, just a reminder for everybody about the why we're here. Uh, we're really focusing on um, moving organizations uh, in their decision-making process from that survive lens, perhaps through that sustain lens, and ideally into the thrive lens. And um, this is really all about thrivability and how your organizations just can ultimately be stronger uh, and, you can, and you can be just better at uh, your overall strategic decision-making. So ultimately um, we want through this session to continue to remind you that uh, mission should guide what you do in your decision-making and at the same time, uh, today, we'll introduce looking at your decision making through an economic lens. And um, this is all intended to be about applying more rigor and discipline 
to uh, your strategic decision making process. So we do have an action packed session today, as usual. Uh, we'll do a, just a moment of introductions for those of you uh, who haven't been on previous sessions. We'll spend a, uh, just a couple of minutes doing a flashback to our first webinar and webversation. And then uh, we'll dive into our decision making framework by looking at it through an economic centric lens and then bringing the two lenses together, both mission centric and um, economically informed lenses. And then we'll talk about what's next. So Josephine, uh, I'm gonna let you introduce the first poll question, and this is an interesting one. <laughs> Very interesting. Here we go. Which Disney character matches your organization's decision-making tendencies? Winnie the Pooh, Dory from Finding Nemo, Jafar from Aladdin, Mary Poppins, Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio, or Peter Pan? So again, which Disney character matches your organization's decision-making tendencies? This might be one of my favorite poll questions we do. How do you look at your organization a little bit differently than usual? So I'll give you a couple more seconds to make your choice. And everybody answer. And I'll share those results. Looks like Mary Poppins is the winner with Winnie the Pooh and Jiminy Cricket very close behind. Right. Mike? Okay, well, yeah, you're sort of all over the map here, um, but <laughs> definitely an interesting question. The only one we didn't get was uh, anybody voting for Jafar from Aladdin, so that's interesting. I will say that we've asked this question in the past, and. Typically, uh, we get the most votes for Mary Poppins. So, you know, kind of that organized, very direct, uh, you know, no fuss, no muss approach. So uh, thank you all for, for sharing uh, just an interesting question and interesting perspective to think about. So by way of just brief introductions, again, for those of you who haven't uh, met me, I'm Mike Oxman. I'm one of the managing partners and principals at no margin, no mission. Uh, and I am zooming in from Chicago today. And uh, my partner in crime uh, is a guy named Larry Clark. Larry, you wanna say hello and wave? Good morning, everybody. I'm zooming in from the Seattle area. All right. And uh, our, our friends and colleagues from the Patterson Foundation who are joining us today as well. Uh, you've already heard from Connor LaGrange. Uh, Connor is a fellow at the Patterson Foundation, uh, the guy who just waved. We also have with us, I believe Michael Zimmerman has joined us. Uh, he is also a fellow at the Patterson Foundation. Michael, are you there? Hi, everyone. I'm here. Great to be here. Thanks so much, Mike. Welcome. And of course, uh, Josephine Eisenberg. Uh, without her, we wouldn't have uh, our session today or any of our other sessions as part of AMT. So Josephine, thank you. And of course, uh, our AMT emoji and chief thrivability mascot, Alexander Miles Thrivemore. You'll see him pop up at various points throughout our session today. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Larry to take us through a little bit of a flashback. Let's just take just a couple of minutes and think back to webinar number one. So part of what we did, Mike, do you wanna, uh, you know, we're living in this roller coaster kind of world. Um, hopefully we're coming, we're going down right now and maybe it'll flatten out just a bit, but um, we've all kind of lived through this and tried to navigate it. And a lot of decisions have been made over the past year. So we focused on cope, adapt, and innovate, and how organizations move through those kind of three phases and sometimes rotate back all the way to cope or maybe rotate from innovate to adapt. And most of you um, through the survey process are somewhere between adapt and innovate, which uh, we're really glad that you're there. But I um, mean, each one of these phases is decision-making that has to take place. Um, lots of decisions have been made over the past year. Then we use the term tsunami. Um, hopefully the waves are kind of slowing down and maybe getting smaller. Um, but you know, we're help, we're here and you're here 
to learn maybe how to make some better decisions in the future? How can we learn from the things in the past? So last time we focused on mission. We had all the different programs. Hopefully you've done a little bit of that homework over the past week, but uh, we focus on the programs and mission-centric decision-making. Um, we used 100,000 as the cut and using your mission to make those decisions and not necessarily the economic side of it. Um, and then you hopefully did some homework. We had two worksheets, Cope, Adapt, and Innovate, and also Mission-Centric Decision-Making. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. Let's, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Josephine, for a poll question. Okay, perfect. And the question is, what did your team do to follow up on the two assignments shared during webinar one? We met, discussed, and completed both. We met, discussed, and started at least one. Conversations were had, but no movement on either assignment quite yet. Nothing other things emerged and required our attention. And these are anonymous, just I don't know how familiar you are with the polls. We don't see who's answering. We just see the percentage of people that answered. So feel free to answer honestly. Couple more seconds. And I'll end the poll and share the results. So it looks like conversations were had, but no movement on either assignment quite yet is the predominant one, Larry. And we're really glad most of you um, at least are talking about it back in your agency. Some of you have done all the work, which is awesome. Um, but we also understand how things happen and you can't get things done. <laughs> Crisis happens and maybe you were coping all week long. So um, thank you for doing this and thank you for being honest with us. Mike? Okay. So we'll move into talking about the second uh, method of decision-making. Remember, we've already talked about decision-making through a mission um, centric lens. And today we want to talk about uh, making decisions through what we call an economically informed lens. So when you think about this method of decision making, let's use that example again, that you may need to reduce your budget by $100,000. So as you're thinking about that amongst your team, rather than looking at it in terms of programs and services through that mission centric lens or the mission impact that they've delivered, you're going to look at it uh, through a, a dollars and cents lens. And so the, the, the dollars are going to guide that decision making. So for example, if you do need to cut $100,000 from your budget, you may say, all right, well, we're going to cut marketing and communications out of our budget. And let's say that accounts for $20,000 in expenses that you can cut. And then we're gonna look at some of our more costly programs and services, and we're gonna eliminate those. And let's just say again, for purposes of example, that, that you're gonna cut $40,000 in programs and services. And then perhaps the last thing you would say is, well, we also are gonna to have to reduce some staff or uh, consultants, and that may be another $40,000. So your, your team will get to that $100,000 cut by looking at those three areas and deciding to eliminate them. Okay, so again, this is looking at it through an economic informed lens. But we want to introduce perhaps a better way to think about that so that you're not just looking at it in sort of an, a bit of an arbitrary way and saying, we need to cut $100,000, so these are going to go. So pay close attention here. This, uh, this will be one of your assignments. Okay, so we've got a, a, a sort of a step-by-step -step approach here that you can use uh, as you're thinking this through. So... Uh, we would ask that you look at your most recent annual operating budget for a full 12-month period. 
whatever that 12 months is. If you're, if you're feeling like the last full 12 month period wasn't the best one to look at, perhaps it was an anomaly because of uh, the pandemic and, and, and several considerations, you may wanna look back to the, to the year prior. But again, look at a full 12 month period. And uh, also then think about and look at what financial goals uh, you had in place within your organization. So for example, and again, this is just an example, but you may have had five or six financial goals and perhaps one of them was around grants. So, you know, generating X amount of, uh, of, of revenue through grants. You may have had another goal for donations. You could have had another goal for events, maybe another one for your earned income and then maybe even another one for sponsorships. So uh, making sure that you're looking at and understanding what goals you had in place. And then uh, specifically looking at what you achieved against those financial goals. So at the end of those 12 months, how did you do with your grants? How did you do with your donations? How did you do with your events? Uh, your earned income, if you have it, your sponsorships, and it could be other uh, financial goals as well. So that's step number one. And then the second step is to do sort of an inventory of all your various programs, products, and services. So what are all of those uh, various offerings that you have within your organization. You create a list. So a list could be you have a golf outing, you have an annual fundraiser, you perhaps do public speaking engagements, maybe you do uh, lunch and learns, uh, maybe you have room rentals, and the list could go on and on. But again, those are some examples of those programs, products, and services that you would have on your list. And then what we'd like you to do is to try to order those um, from high to low return, economic return. And when we talk about economic return, what we mean by that is um, taking the revenue, less your expenses. And based on either what you know or what you think from, again, your most recent 12 month year end financials and really just categorize those based on high return, medium return and low or no return. And it may not be you know, as black and white as we would like it to be. But for example, again, pulling from that list that I just shared with you, I might put the golf outing as the high return. I might put room rentals as more of a medium return. And I might put the public speaking engagements at the low or no return. And again, ideally, you're doing this based on actual calculations that you have for revenue less expense. Uh, if you don't have those, use your gut, use your instincts, and think about it from that perspective. Now, as uh, our friend Alex says, and this is an important consideration, even when you do that, and you may have um, numbers that you're actually pulling from. We like to just alert folks to this notion that the, the financials don't always tell the real story. And the reason for that is that in many nonprofits, you may not be fully uh, allocating costs that are incurred to programs, services, and products. For example, you know, a golf outing, you may think you're capturing all those expenses, uh, but the reality might be that you're throwing people and time at it and not necessarily capturing that. So hold that thought, but please think about that in terms of uh, how you're looking at uh, and categorizing the various programs, products, and services uh, and, and ranking them from high to low return. Okay. So we're gonna stop here for a minute and introduce another poll question. Josephine. Yes, hi there. 
So the question is, does your organization track expenses and allocate them to individual programs, services, and products? Yes, absolutely, always. Yes, kind of. Some items are lumped together and others are separate. Not really. We track broadly by area, but not by specific item. That's a good question. I need to find out. Give you a couple of more seconds. Okay, and we'll share. Looks so like this Go is uh, this is good. I think you know the reality is uh, we've got folks sort of equally split between yes, absolutely, always, and yes, kind of. Some items are lumped together and others are separate. We've got a few folks who said, no, nah, not really. Uh, and then we didn't have anybody who said, that's a good question I need to find out. I think the reality here is that this is, it's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. And for those of you uh, who may have answered in the second or the third uh, response area, uh, there's some opportunity for improvement here. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, Let's go on. And uh, Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, um, the third step is really thinking about yourself. And this is going to be part of your homework. So you need to identify your total revenue and expenses, as Mike said, by program services product for the most recent 12 months. So as he said, could be last year, could be the year before, uh, whichever year you feel most comfortable doing a good evaluation on. And then what's your gut feeling here? How do you feel about that from your first program all the way down um, to all the programs listed? So the second thing is using that information, calculate the net profit, the revenue minus expenses for each of your programs, services, and products. So it's taking what Mike said and it's putting it to use. And again, this is going to be part of your homework. So let me give you an example. Um, let's use um, uh, Meals on Wheels again. And they do an annual gala or gala, depending on how you want to say that word. I've heard it so many different ways over the past year. Um, they, uh, their revenue was $75,000 for their gala. And that included all their income, including their tickets and sponsorships and donation items and auction and other ways that they might have generated revenue for that event. And their expenses uh, for that 12 months was about $65,000. So that included their venue, the food, maybe the bar, the entertainment, maybe printing. Um, and two important things to add to your expenses are the staff time that went into actually putting the gala on and also adding an overhead rate into that. Sometimes overhead rates, you know, in nonprofits are anywhere between, you know, 10 and maybe 25% or someplace in between, could be lower, could be higher. But it's really important to, to add both um, staff and overhead into your, uh, your list. And in this case, they had a net profit or return of $10,000. So the third step is once you've kind of listed all of those out is to reprioritize them. They were surprised they had a $10,000 return. Um, they moved it up on their economic list and they re reprior reprioritized that fact versus gut. So on your, when you go back, do the same thing, kind of prioritize them and then look at all the numbers calculated and then reprioritize them versus the net income for each of your programs, products, or services. So the effect of economic informed decision-making, the goal is to calculate the return for every single program, service, and product. And to think through that, you need to have the goals set in place too. So every one of those program services or products should have an experience and a revenue projection. And how do you hold yourself accountable to that? It's by going back and making sure that you met that goal, you were under goal, or maybe you were hopefully over goal as far as net. 
So let's do um, another short poll, Josephine. Hi there, here we go. And the question is, if your organization hosts an annual gala, how would you describe the return generated from the event? Highly profitable, marginally profitable, break even, let's not talk about it. Who could possibly keep track? Good question, I need to find out. From some of the events, the galas I've done, sometimes the answer was who could possibly keep track? We'd figure it out in the end, but in the middle of it, that would be my answer for sure. So I'll give you guys a couple more seconds. Again, how would you describe the return generated from your annual galas? And I think that's everyone, so I'll end and share. And it's marginally profitable is the winner with highly profitable as the second choice, Larry. So just um, keep this in mind. Uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to talk about this, this gala again and keep in mind where you voted. Um, it'll be important. Thanks, Josephine. Sure. Nick? I guess, um, any questions? I guess we'll stop at this point uh, for just a second. Mike, do you wanna take it off of screen share? We can open it up just a little bit, see if people have questions. Anybody wanna raise their hand or take themselves off of mute and ask a question? Larry, there are. There are oh, no, you go, Connor, go, go, go. go. At the same Connor. time, we're so in sync, Josephine. There are several uh, questions in the chat box if we want to start with those. Okay. I can read those off. Uh, one was, will you also address the economic question of increasing program income since budget is very slender slash driven by supporting a herd of, her a herd of horses? I, um, I guess the answer is yes, we will. Uh, when we get to the next phase, we'll talk about how do you, how do you, how do you think through increasing that revenue? Another question, how do you calculate the value slash cost of programs run completely by volunteers? Um, I guess when you put your budget together for the, for the organization, you still have a revenue, you still have an expense line item, and you maybe don't have that staffing component, but you still have all the expenses on the revenue. That's how you budget it. That's how you compare it at the end. Did you turn a profit or not? And then another one from Jonathan. I'm gonna slightly summarize. How do we track non-cash benefits of events like a gala? where you may receive donations as a result of the gala after someone attended. So he said, we recently had an event which was marginally profitable in terms of direct costs slash income, but we just secured some significant donations afterwards as a result. Well, How, you know, is this worth tracking? Well, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you can all be so fortunate to be in that position. Um, I guess, you know, depending on how your organization is set up, it might be that you have um, a fundraiser on staff and that person would want to track it separately as an individual donation, could be, or it could be that you, it's, you can directly tie it into that event and because they were there, you add it to the revenue stream so it shows up as a, as a greater, hopefully a net revenue uh, for the event. So. Bottom line is it's money that your organization didn't necessarily count on. And where you choose to book that, whether it's a donation directly or for this event, it's really up to you. Well, and if I can just add to that, if in fact that donation came directly as a result uh, of that individual participating in the fundraiser, then uh, you know, attribute it to the ROI of that event. <laughs> If it would have happened otherwise, uh, outside of that event, then um, you know you would probably not categorize that as part of the ROI. So it just it's something to think about. If it came directly from that, it's a good way to uh, you know to to look at the ROI on that event. Barbara. 
Could you please um, um, restate your answer to the volunteer question? I'm not sure I followed you. Please. Um, I, I do you use volunteers, Barbara. Is that okay? Do you in your budget? Is there anything for volunteers? Any of their time? No. No. So if it's not in your budget and you don't count on it, then you don't show that as a staff expense. You can't expense that out, I guess, in a budget at least. Um, so it doesn't necessarily show up. So your um, if, if you get the, the work done and it's all volunteer based, then whatever that net revenue that you hopefully projected, um, you know, hopefully you'll meet that, that need. I'm still confused. I'm so sorry. So we have like material costs for some of our programs that are volunteer run. Um, so how would you factor that in? I'm not quite sure if you're saying you just don't even count it as a, as a program or a service or you do count it, but you don't have any. So what do you do with your volunteer hours? Do they go on your 990? Do they, do they go back to the individual? as a tax write-off to, is there anything you do with that? We don't do anything with them. Okay. So it's basically a free service that you're getting from people who are donating their time. So if you budgeted, so for instance, if you budgeted to have staff do that work and volunteers stepped in and did it, then you have a cost savings, obviously. If you didn't budget for the staff time and you counted on the volunteers to do the work, then you probably broke even at least on the time spent on it. Um, you know, when we help organizations think about earned income, even though they want to use volunteers, we always help them budget to use staff. And if they can then support it through volunteer effort, all the better, they can save some resources then. But, okay. Should we move on? Oh, Melissa, do you have a question? Well, yeah, if I, I, I figured that out finally. Um, yeah, I was the one that raised that question because we have only two paid staff people in the whole organization. But we have, for instance, the last gala we held, um, I, as a volunteer, was in charge of the gala. The whole gala committee was all volunteers. Everybody that put on the gala was volunteers. There were no staff costs at all. I mean, the staff attended, but they attended as, as um, participants, <laughs> guests. Yeah. Um, so, but we do claim, take pride in reporting, you know, 15,000 volunteer hours every year. And the only thing that I was afraid of is that if you don't figure out a way to calculate that, that value, you can burn out your volunteers throwing a gala, which takes you, I don't know, a night to throw it and three weeks to get ready for it and a week afterwards to recover from it. And they aren't able to do other things for your organization. Right, so right. Is, there a, is there a thumbnail for saying, okay, I wanna say my volunteers are giving me a $10 an hour, whatever. Cause we do keep track by hour of how much each volunteer volunteers. Well, I just think you need to, um, even if you tracked it that way, and you thought about how much time they actually put into it, what was the return on that pretty much free investment of time? Was the return great enough for you? Or could you put all that time together for another way where you could generate money um, and resources for the agency, whether they go after private donors or whether, you know, could it, could it be time better spent? We see so many organizations where they have a break even or just a little teeny profit margin, and they have spent a huge amount of time putting that event on, it basically becomes a marketing event for them or an advertising event. Um, and people feel okay about that. Well, if that's what it is, call it that. Don't necessarily call it a fundraiser, right? So I don't know. I, I just take a step back, Melissa, and just think about how much time goes into it. And it was it worth your time and their time to generate X amount of resources, or could it be done a better way in the future? Right. Because um, because in the past, when you could have galas, our gala raised one quarter of our annual budget. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, it really was a, a big financial success. 
Yeah. I just always was concerned that I was wearing our volunteers out and that yeah. well, that's, <laughs> it always, it that's a good question for every organization, right? All right, Mike, we should probably move on. Thank you, Moza, though, for the question. Okay. So um, we're gonna go into the final decision method. And uh, this is our opportunity to uh, bring together the two lenses that we've shared uh, both during webinar number one and then uh, during the first part of webinar number two today. So combining uh, decision-making through both the mission-centric and the uh, economic informed lenses. Um, our friend Alexander uh, says here, we shared methods to prioritize your programs, products, and services through both mission and econom economic lenses. Now let's look at how to bring them together. All right, so we're gonna walk you through the step-by-step -step process here. And this is, again, this is a really good way to think about your decision-making, uh, both looking at your programs, your products and services um, through both the mission and economic impact analysis that you've done or will do by program and product and service. So as you can see from this visual here, we've simply lined up uh, all the programs, products and services that you inventoried under the mission impact side. And then we've also lined them up under the uh, economic impact side. And we're gonna bring those together. So what we're hoping you can do here, the second step in this process is uh, to, to go through on both sides, the mission and the economic uh, sides and categorize or assign each product program or service as delivering high, medium, or low, or no impact. So when we say high, that would typically mean it was above goal. Uh, if it's a medium mission impact, it would probably be at goal. And if it's a low mission impact, uh, it would likely have been below goal. And the same is true on the economic side. So as you calculate uh, sort of the return, you know, looking at revenue less expense, for each of those products, programs, and services, how would they be categorized in terms of delivering high return, medium return, or low return? And then we introduce um, what we call a mission and return matrix, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment. This is a great tool that you can use in your organizations if you haven't already done so. And the idea would be that um, you would plot each program, service, and product where it would fall on this mission and return matrix. And we'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. But briefly, just to describe this matrix, um, it is, it's very simple, but quite powerful. So if you look at that smiley face up in the top right corner that says high mission, high return, that's ideally where you would want as many of your programs, products, and services to fall because they are creating the most impact for your organization. Conversely, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the at the quadrant on the matrix that says low mission, low return. If you have any products, programs, and services that fall in that quadrant, they are not doing your organization that much good, if at all. And oftentimes you would be surprised that after going through this exercise, you may have uh, some of your programs, products, and services that are falling down in that quadrant. Might be things that have been hanging around for a long time, might be things that you just did and you keep doing because you've always done them that way, might be because, oh, maybe you had a board member who wanted you to do something because they thought it was the right thing to do, but lo and behold, it's not offering much in terms of mission or economic return. 
Where you see that heart, the high mission, low return quadrant is where you will likely have many of your uh, programs and services falling. And that's okay, because remember as nonprofits, we got a lot of high mission stuff that we do. We also have a lot of you know, the things that we do that don't deliver a high return. But if you, if you find that those offerings fall in that quadrant, there might be a way to move them over toward that high mission, high return quadrant. So that gets at this idea that somebody asked about earlier, how do you increase your income, your revenue? And that's a really good place to, to start and to think. That little dollar sign in the bottom right corner, which is the low mission, high return quadrant, is also, a, it's a good place to be. So for example, you, your organization, we, use, we, you know, we frequently say, if you own a building and your building has billboards on it, a billboard on it, or has a cell tower on it, uh, you may be generating revenue from that. It's not doing anything for your mission, uh, but it sure is generating return and that's okay. Um, so you, you may have tax implications as a result of that, you likely will, but that's all right. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about this in a moment. Larry, you're gonna take over, but I just, again, want to make sure that everybody now has this sort of visual in their mind about this mission and return matrix. It's a great tool. Larry. So let's, let's use the example of the gala again from Meals on Wheels. And so they wanted 200 people to come to their gala. They actually got 300 people at their gala. So they were really happy. More people showed up, but they got less sponsors than they thought they would get. So, but they still generated $10,000 in excess revenue. So lots of folks showed up. Um, and they made $10,000. So where do they get placed? Probably right there, kind of right in between high mission, um, uh, low return and high mission, high return. They had a $10,000 profit margin. It's pretty good. And they had more people show up than they expected. So it's great. But that's just one of the programs that they have. Meals on Wheels has a lot of different programs. They do meal distribution, they have a curriculum, maybe they have a store, they do training, counseling, and, and you know they have a great space, so they do some room rental too. So where do all those get placed? Let's think about that. Mike, do you wanna? So in this case, as they put both of their um, columns together, their financial column and their mission, a uh, return column, this is where they got placed. So you can see their gala training and counseling doing pretty well, high mission, high return. Where do you think um, they received uh, the, the least amount of resources and the least amount of mission? And if they were going to move something out of their organization, what it might be? Anybody want to tap, put something in the chat box? Where you would cut? or at least put something on hold, or maybe find another um, organization that would take it on. No one's responding. Well, let's let Alexander point to uh, where you might do that. So if you need to reduce your budget, you might think about the curriculum in the online store. It might be actually costing you money and delivering that uh, with very, very low return very few people might be um, getting that service. So you might put it on hold or you might move it out or you might just get rid of it. As Mike said, um, maybe it's uh, something you've done for a very, very long time and uh, maybe don't need to do it. So the next one is what, and this gets back to Melissa's question. If you were doing something um, that was really high mission, you want to move it over to high return, what might that be? And in this case, it's meal distribution. So they might be able to generate more donations or get another foundation or somehow generate resources to get more meals distributed and maybe increase maybe their overhead rate in that area, um, maybe figure out another way to generate um, the cost per meal um, and move it over into the um, high return area also. So maybe more people 
gather some more resources and move it to the right as an example. So this is a really good tool for you to use. Um, there, uh, um, you know, think about all your programs, products and services, and as you place them on here, where do they mostly fall? And this is part of your homework is we want you to take a step back and think through this and to actually map it out because I think you'll be surprised um, at what might be in low mission, low return, and you might have to take a step back and make some decisions around those things. Um, whether it's at a staffing level, at a volunteer level, or at a board level. So it's a, it's a great tool. And we always hear from organizations after they use this that it's very, very powerful. Let's uh, do our next poll question. Josephine. Hey there again. Okay, here we go. Thinking about your organization's collective array of programs, services and products, how would you characterize them as a whole? Heavy on delivering mission impact, heavy on generating revenue, perfectly balanced between the two, neither unfortunately light on both or never considered that before, but I will. So again, the question is thinking about your organization's collective array of program services products, how would you characterize them as a whole? You guys are quick answering this one. Give you a couple more seconds. A clear winner. <laughs> and, you know, just exactly as Mike said, you know, top right, uh, lots of mission impact, uh, but maybe marginal on um, the economic side of it. So this, uh, this is a, a pretty um, common. Thanks, Josephine. Sure. So let's continue. Um, just to recap, we introduced a couple of new ways of thinking about um, how you look at what you offer within your organization to better inform your decision making. So your homework is going to be to work on those two exercises with your team. One is looking at um, this economic informed decision making three step process, where you start with mission goals results, you inventory and rank them, and then you use information and analysis to essentially categorize them or prioritize them. And then using this mission and return matrix that we just shared to bring both the, uh, the mission impact and the financial return uh, that's delivered for each of your product program and services together. Plot them uh, on that matrix and use them to think about <coughs> what you fall in those various quadrants. A couple of other suggested uh, action steps that we have for you is Share this information, these tools, um, and this thinking internally. So it could be with your, you know, with your full staff, your board, uh, volunteers, and others, you know, other stakeholders uh, for whom it would make sense to share that. It oftentimes can open up new ways of thinking, uh, new ways of understanding, and new ways of acting. And then also, we always suggest use it to help guide perhaps board education, staff education, um, that strategic decision-making process, and even planning and management and oversight within your organizations. Um, and I, I, again, as we're getting ready to wrap things up in this webinar, uh, we'll come back to where we started, which is the focus of today, along with uh, our first webinar, uh, is really to help strengthen your organizations by bringing mission-centric and economically informed decision-making lenses together. So always ensuring mission guides what you do and at the same time, considering the economic impact of your programs and products and services and using that rigor and that discipline um, to, to really help you go through and move through this process. So let me pause just for a moment, um, since we've thrown a lot at you with kind of this combined mission-centric, economically informed decision-making process and the matrix. Does anybody have any questions uh, or comments that 
uh, that you'd like to share. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask Connor anything in the chat box uh, that anybody has noted up to this point. Uh, yes, there is one other question. Let me pull it up. Um, <laughs> it's from Karen with Parish Playworks, and it was uh, asking about if their annual income is under 25000 and they don't need to calculate volunteer hours uh, for the IRS, how should they go about calculating that? I think that's, Karen, you can chime in. I think that's what you were asking. Right, how um, calculating volunteer hours is, is nothing that we felt like we, we needed to do. I mean, is it just, are you saying it's just strategically and economically advisable just to know? Um, or is it, is it vital to do? For instance, if we're putting on a show, even during the rehearsal process, you know, people come and go and do, and we're all wearing different hats. I mean, I, I will be directing, someone will be acting, someone's doing props, some our tech director. And, and so we don't have anyone there to say, oh, check in and write down your hours, please. Um, how important is it? It's, uh, I'll just start. First of all, it does add a layer of complexity for sure. You know, because- a layer of layer of complexity to your organization it, because you do once you have to start tracking hours um you know somebody's got to do that as you said and it has to be done in a way that is that has some you know some rigor and discipline uh involved with it but i will say that many of the organizations that we work with they do track those volunteer hours there is benefit to doing that for both the individuals who are volunteering because oftentimes they want to uh, commit to a certain number of volunteer hours uh, over the course of a year. Uh, and it also, it, it can be beneficial to your organization to track and report those volunteer hours as well. So uh, again, I mean, I think it's one of those things that it's not a must do, uh, but it certainly can have benefit for your organization. Uh, Larry, anything else to add? No, I think, well, I, I think just one thing, Karen, I, I would suggest talking to your tax advisor, whoever does your taxes every year for you, and just see if there's a benefit, a tax side benefit to tracking those hours. Because, you know, depending on the state or depending on the year, there might be some type of benefit for that for you. We don't make enough money as a 501c3 for the IRS to bother with us. We just uh, send them something that says, hey, we made under $25,000. They say, okay. Okay. So I, I'm not seeing the benefit quite yet to adding that okay. layer of complexity. Well, well, so, well, hopefully the goal is you'll have 50,000 in revenue next year. And you might have to worry about that as a complex problem, that right? Great. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Is there another question, Connor? Okay, Mike. All right, then um, let's go to sort of our, our closing for the session. What's next? So uh, our series will continue next week uh, for our fourth and final session. Again, uh, it's our second webversation. Uh, that's on Wednesday the 10th uh, from 11 to, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, from 11 to 12. No, is that right? 10 to 11. 10 to 11, sorry, Eastern. And um, in during that session, we are going to talk about, in addition you know, to you bringing questions that you might have as you've gone through the process of looking at both you know, kind of this, this matrix uh, of combining mission and economic return for your programs, products, and services, we're also going to talk about how you can be considered for um, some one-to-one -one consulting support from, from No Margin, No Mission. So it's kind of the, the next phase of this for those who want to delve deeper. And uh, we'll, again, please come next week because we'll tell you how you can participate in that. But in the meantime, uh, continue to work on these exercises. Uh, we ur urge you to begin that process uh, after today's session. 
Again, come with your questions uh, to the webversation next week. And if you have any questions that you want to send us or comments prior to the webversation, please feel free to do that. Uh, you can email us or Josephine and we'll get back to you. Um, and again, stay tuned for more next week about what is next in terms of this consulting opportunity. Uh, if, you, if your organization has interest, um, has you know, really need and wants to pursue and delve deeper, uh, we will definitely uh, give consideration to those organizations that have participated. Mike, can I mention one thing? Yeah. Um, we always get this question. There's absolutely no cost for your organizations to move forward for one-on-one -on -one consulting. The Patterson Foundation, it's a gift from them. So those that are selected, um, your cost will be your time. Thanks, Mike. Good. Uh, and one last thing, you will get a email or an e invitation tomorrow to register for webversation number two. And uh, you do need to register each of your team members to participate. And then uh, once you register, you'll get a separate Zoom link uh, that will come from Josephine uh, prior to next Wednesday's session. So, and Mike, there, there's a quick question about the forms for the assignment. Will you just let them know when they'll get those? Yes, so when you receive the e-invitation tomorrow, there will be uh, links that will uh, include the worksheets for both of the items that we shared with you today. So there will be a, a handout or a worksheet that specifically is focused on um, looking at your products, programs, and services by economic return. And then there will also be a worksheet that has that uh, mission and return matrix on it that will allow you to go through and ultimately plot the programs, products, and services uh, on that as well. So you will get all of that uh, tomorrow in a, in a separate email. And last week uh, during the webversation, there were no worksheets. That was the second part of her question. So don't worry about last week's worksheets. There were none. So does anybody have any questions just about timing or logistics uh, or next steps? because uh, we've got a, just another couple of minutes before we, we wrap. Do you, wanna, do you wanna open it up, Mike? Sure. Yeah. Anything in the chat box uh, or anybody have a, any questions that they'd like to ask before we wrap and say goodbye? Okay, well then everybody gets, oh, Greg, Greg go ahead. Yes, yes, I do. So you mentioned if you're selected, if an organization is small but has, you know, some grand plans and has had a sustained um, upward mobility, is it still possible we would not, or using us, would not be selected to go forward uh, with uh, consulting? How does that, how does the selection oh, process well, you'll work? You'll see, again, tune in next Wednesday. We'll walk you through the process, but essentially there will be a, just a sim very simple uh, application, like a, a two question application that will just ask you to fill out and respond to. And then we'll also ask you to share the, the worksheets uh, that you've done as part of these uh, sessions and the thinking that's gone into it. So it's really gonna be those, uh, those two things that we'll ask you to share with us, okay? And, Perfect, thank uh, you. The size of your organization is, you know, to us, that's, um, that's not important uh, to the selection process. We want, you know, we just want organizations that have real interest um, and, 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 uh, and need for delving deeper and to see that you've done some of the thinking and work leading up to that process. And, Thank you. and typically, Greg, um, each organization focuses on something just a little bit different. It's like, what's the greatest need do you have and how can we help kind of walk through that with some process. So stay tuned for next week. We'll give you some other examples. Will do. All right, everybody. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate the time you've spent with us today, your good questions. Um, again, come next Wednesday to our webversation. You'll learn more and uh, importantly, you'll better understand how to move to the next phase of this, uh, of this initiative. So. 
Thank you all. Uh, we look you. forward to seeing you next next week. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.